Chapter Two of Love Romances of the Aristocracy. Love Romances of the Aristocracy by Thornton Hall. Chapter Two: The Nightingale of Bath. A century and a half ago, Bath had reached the zenith of her fame and allurement, not only as Queen of the West, but as Empress of all the haunts of pleasure in England. She drew, as by an irresistible magnet, rank and beauty and wealth to her shrine. In her famous assembly rooms, statesmen rubbed shoulders with card sharpers, marquises with well sought mobsmen, and countesses with courtesans all in eager quest of pleasure or conquest or gain the bath season was england's carnival when cares and ceremonial alike were thrown to the winds when the pleasure of the moment was the only ambition worth pursuing and when even the prudish found a fearful joy in playing hide-and-seek with vice but although the fairest women in the land flocked to bath by common consent, not one of them all was so beautiful and bewitching as Elizabeth Ann Linley, the girl Nightingale, whose voice entranced the ear daily at the assembly room's concerts as her loveliness feasted the eye. She was, as all the world knew, only the daughter of Thomas Linley, singing master and organizer of the concerts, a man who had plied chisel and saw at the carpenter's bench before he found the music that was in him. But obscure as was her birth, she reigned supreme by virtue of a loveliness and a gift of song which none of her sex could rival. It is thus little wonder that Elizabeth Linley's fame had traveled far beyond the west country town in which she was cradled, George the Third had summoned her to sing to him in his London palace, and had been so overcome by her gifts of beauty and melody that with tears streaming down his cheeks, he had stroked her hair and caressed her hands, and declared to the blushing girl that he had never seen anyone so beautiful or heard a voice so divinely sweet. Charles Dibden tried to enshrine her in fitting verse, but abandoned the effort in despair, vowing that she was indeed of that company described by Milton, quote, who, as they sang, would take the prisoned soul and lap it in Elysium. The Bishop of Meath, in his unepiscopal enthusiasm, declared that she was the link between an angel and a woman while Dr. Charles Burney, supreme musician and father of the more famous Madame d'Arblay, wrote more soberly of her, quote, The tone of her voice and expression were as enchanting as her countenance and conversation, with a mellifluous tone voice, a perfect shake and intonation. She was possessed of the double power of delighting an audience equally in pathetic strains and songs of brilliant execution, which is allowed to very few singers. To her, Horace Walpole also paid this curious tribute. Quote, Miss Linley's beauty is in the superlative degree. The king admires and ogles her as much as he dares to do in so holy a place as an oratorio. Such are a few of the tributes of which contemporary records are full, paid to the fair Nightingale of Bath, whom Gainsborough and Reynolds immortalized in two of their inspired canvases, the latter as Cecilia, her face almost superhuman in its beauty and the divine rapture of its expression, seated at a harpsichord and pouring out her soul in song. It was inevitable that a girl of such charms and gifts, quote, superior to all the handsome things I have heard of her, John Wilkes wrote, quote, and with all the most modest, pleasing, and delicate flower I have seen, should have lovers by the score. Every gallant who came to Bath sought to woo, if not to win her. But Elizabeth Linley was no coquette, nor was she a foolish girl whose head could be turned by a handsome face or pretty compliments, or whose eyes could be dazzled by the glitter of wealth and rank. She was wedded to her music, and no lover, she vowed, should wean her from her allegiance. 
It was thus a shock to the world of pleasure seekers at Bath to learn that the beauty, who had turned a cold shoulder to so many high-placed gallants, had promised her hand to an elderly, unattractive wooer called Long, a man almost old enough to be her grandfather. That her heart had not gone with her hand, we may be sure. We know that it was only under the strong compulsion of her father that she had given her consent, for Mr. Long had a purse as elongated as his name, and to the eyes of the poor singing master his gold bags were irresistible. Her elderly wooer loaded his bride-to-be with costly presents. He showered jewels on her, bought her a trousseau fit for a queen, and was on the eve of marrying her when, without a word of warning, it was announced that the wedding, to which all Bath had been excitedly looking forward, would not take place. Mr. Linley was furious and threatened the terrors of the law, but the bridegroom that failed was adamant. It was said that in cancelling the engagement, Mr. Long was acting a chivalrous part in response to Miss Linley's pleading that he would withdraw his suit, since her heart could never be his, and by withdrawing, shield her from her father's anger. However this may have been, Mr. Long steadily declined to go to the altar, and ultimately appeased the singing master by settling three thousand pounds on his daughter, and allowing her to keep the valuable jewels and other presents he had given her. It was at this crisis in the Nightingale's life, when all Bath was ringing with the fiasco of her engagement, and she herself was overcome by humiliation, that another and more dangerous lover made his appearance at Bath a youth, for such he was, whose life was destined to be dramatically linked with hers. This newcomer into the arena of love was none other than Richard Brinsley Sheridan, grandson of Dean Swift's bosom friend, Mr. Thomas Sheridan, one of the two sons of another Thomas, who, after a roaming and profitless life, had come to Bath to earn a livelihood by teaching elocution. This younger Thomas Sheridan seems to have inherited none of the wit and cleverness of his father, Swift's boon companion. Dr. Johnson considered him, quote, dull, naturally dull, such an excess of stupidity, he added, is not in nature. But in spite of his dullness, Sherry, as he was commonly called, had been clever enough to coax a pension of two hundred pounds a year out of the government, and was able to send his two boys to Harrow and Oxford. The Sheridan boys had been but a few days in Bath when they both fell head over heels in love with Elizabeth Linley, with whom their sister had been equally quick to strike up a friendship. But from the first, Charles, the elder son, was hopelessly outmatched. Quote, On our first acquaintance, Miss Linley wrote in later leaps, later years both professed to love me but yet i preferred the youngest as by far the most agreeable in person beloved by every one indeed from a boy richard sheridan seemed born to win hearts his sister has confessed quote, i admired i almost adored him he was handsome his cheeks had the glow of health, his eyes, the finest in the world, the brilliancy of genius, and were soft as tender an affectionate heart could render them. The same playful fancy, the same sterling and innoxious wit that was shown afterwards in his writings, cheered and delighted the family circle. Such was Richard Brinsley Sheridan, when, in the year 1769, he first set eyes on the girl who, after many dramatic vicissitudes, was to bear his name and share his glories. From the first sight of her, he was hopelessly in love, although none but his sister knew it. He was little more than a schoolboy, and was content to bide his time, worshipping mutely at the shrine of the girl whom some day he meant to make his own. 
He gave no sign of jealousy when his elder brother made love to her before his eyes, only to retire quickly, chilled by a coldness which he realized he could never thaw. Or even when his Oxford chum, Halhead, his dearest friend and the colleague of his youthful pen, fell a victim to Elizabeth's charms and, in his innocence, begged Sheridan to plead his suit with her. Halhead, too, had to retire from the hopeless suit, and Richard Sheridan, still silent, save perhaps for the eloquence of his tell-tale eyes, held the field alone. It was at this stage of our story that a grave element of danger entered Elizabeth Linley's life with the arrival at Bath of a Major Matthews, a handsome rouille with a large rent roll from Welsh acres and a dangerous reputation won in the lists of love. At sight of the fair nightingale in the assembly rooms, this hero of many conquests was himself laid low. He was frantically in love, and before many days had passed, vowed that he would shoot himself if his charmer refused to smile on him. Her coldness only fanned his ardor, and his persecution reached such a pitch that in her alarm she appealed to young Sheridan for help. Nothing could have been more fortunate for the young lover than such an appeal and the necessity for it. It was a tribute to her esteem and to his budding manliness, which delighted him. Moreover, it gave him many opportunities of meeting her and talking over the situation with her. At any cost, this persecution must end, and the result of the conferences was that an excellent plan was evolved. Richard was to worm himself into the confidence of the major, and in the character of friend and well-wisher was to advise him, as a matter of diplomacy, to cease his attentions to Miss Linley for a time. Meanwhile, arrangements were to be made for the Nightingale's escape to France, where she proposed to enter a convent until she was of age, thus finding a refuge from the persecution to which her beauty constantly subjected her, and also from the scandal which the long fiasco had given rise to, and which was still a great source of unhappiness to her. The plot was cunningly planned and worked smoothly. The major was induced by subtle pleading to leave Miss Linley in peace for a time, and, to quote Miss Sheridan, At length they fixed on an evening when Mr. Linley, his eldest son, and Miss Mary Linley were engaged at the concert, Miss Linley being excused on the plea of illness, to set out on their journey. Sheridan brought a sedan chair to Mr. Linley's house in the Crescent, in which he had Miss Linley conveyed to a post-chaise that was waiting for them on the London road. A woman was in the chaise, who had been hired to accompany them on this extraordinary elopement. For elopement it really was, although ostensibly Sheridan was merely playing the part of a friendly escort to a distressed lady, whatever deeper scheme, unknown to her, may have been in his mind. After a brief stay in London, a boat was taken to Dunkirk, and the journey resumed towards Lillet. It was during this stage of the journey that Sheridan disclosed his hand. With consummate, if questionable, cleverness, he explained that he could not in honor leave her in a convent except as his wife, that he had loved her since first he met her more than anything else in life, and that he could not bear the thought of her fair name being sullied by the scandal that would surely follow this journey taken in his company. To such plausible arguments, pleaded by one who confessed that he loved her, and to whom she was, as she now realized, far from indifferent, Miss Linley could not remain deaf. And before the coach had traveled many miles from Calais, the runaways found an accommodating priest to make them one. The would-be nun thus dramatically ended her journey to the convent at the altar. It was not, she wrote to him later, your person that gained my affection. No, it was that delicacy, that tender interest which you seemed to take in my welfare, that were the motives which induced me to love you. The honeymoon that followed these strange nuptials was of short duration, 
for a few days later, Mr. Linley arrived in a state of high anger to reclaim and carry off his runaway daughter, and Sheridan was left to follow ignominiously in their wake. When he reached Bath, it was to find his hands full. During his absence, the irate major, quick to discover his perfidy, had published the following notice in the local chronicle. Quote, Mr. Richard S., having attempted in a letter left behind him for that purpose, to account for his scandalous method of running away from this place, by insinuations derogating from my character and that of a young lady, innocent as far as relates to me or my knowledge, since which he has neither taken notice of my letters nor even informed his own family of the place where he has hid himself. I cannot longer think he deserves the treatment of a gentleman than in this public manner to post him as a liar and a treacherous scoundrel, Thomas Matthews. Such a public insult could, of course, only have one issue. Sheridan promptly challenged Matthews to a duel, the result of which was that the major was compelled to make an apology, as public as his insult. But so far was he from penitence that within a few weeks he demanded a second meeting, and this proved a much more serious matter for Sheridan. The rivals met the following morning on Claverton Down, and after a few furious exchanges both swords were broken, and the opponents were struggling together on the ground. Matthews, however, being much the stronger, was able to pin Sheridan down, and, with a piece of the broken sword, stabbed him repeatedly in the face. "'Beg your life, and I will spare it,' he demanded of the prostrate and defenseless man. "'I will neither beg it nor receive it from such a villain,' was the unflinching answer. Quote, Matthews then renewed the attack, and having picked up the point of one of the swords, ran it through the side of the throat and pinned him to the ground with it, exclaiming, I have done for him! And then he left the field, accompanied by his second, and getting into a carriage with four horses, which had been waiting for him, drove off. Sheridan, unconscious and apparently dying, was driven from the downs to a neighboring inn the White Heart, where for a time he hung betwixt life and death. On hearing of his condition, Miss Linley, who at the time was singing at Cambridge, traveled post-haste to his bedside, and tenderly nursed by his wife and his sister, the wounded man slowly fought his way back to strength. One would have thought that after such a tragic experience and observing the mutual devotion of the young couple, their parents would have relented and given their approval of the union, however improvident and inexcusable it might appear to them. But on both sides they were obdurate, and Mr. Sheridan carried his opposition to the extent of extracting from his son a promise that he would not even see his wife. But love laughs at parents' frowns, and usually triumphs in the end. When Elizabeth Linley went away to London to sing in oratorio, her husband followed her, and in the role of hackney coachman, had the pleasure of driving not only his wife, but her father, home nightly from the concert room, without either of them suspecting his identity. When at last he revealed himself to his wife, her delight was so great as to leave no doubt of the sincere love she bore him. Many a secret meeting followed. A final joint appeal ultimately broke down the obduracy of the parents. And once again, Sheridan led his bride to the altar, to make her finally and securely his own. For a time, Richard Sheridan and his nightingale found a haven in a remote, rose-covered cottage at East Burnham. These were days of unclouded happiness when the world forgetting and by the world forgot they lived only for love caring nothing of the future they were days of simple delights for their entire income was the interest of mr long's three thousand pounds which proved ample for their needs mrs sheridan now at the zenith of her fame might have won thousands by her voice she actually refused offers of nearly four thousand pounds for one short season 
but her husband wished to keep the nightingale's voice for his own exclusive delight, and she was only too happy in thus turning her back on fame and fortune. But such halcyon days could not last long. Even paradise might pall on such a restless temperament as that of Richard Brinsley Sheridan. He began to sigh for the outer world in which he felt that it was his destiny to shine, for an arena in which he could do justice to the gifts which were clamoring for scope and exercise. And thus, to Mrs. Sheridan's lasting regret, cottage and roses and simple delights of the country were left behind, and she found herself installed in a Portman Square house in the heart of the world of fashion. Here, Sheridan, always the most improvident of men, launched out into extravagances more suited to an income of £5,000 a year than the paltry £150, which was all he could command. He entertained on a lavish scale, and his wit and charm, supplemented by his wife's beauty and gift of song, soon surrounded them with a fashionable crowd eager to eat his dinners and to attend his wife's soirees. Sheridan was in his element in this environment of luxury and prodigality, but the Bath Nightingale would gladly have changed it all for, quote, a little quiet home that I can enjoy in comfort, as she told her husband. Above all, for the Burnham Cottage, where she had been so idyllically happy. Perhaps if Sheridan had never left the cottage in the roses, his name would never have been known to fame. His ambition needed some such stimulus as this spasm of extravagance to wake it to activity. He must now make money or be submerged by debts. And under this impulse of necessity, it was that he wooed a fortune with the rivals and awoke to find himself famous and potentially rich. Other comedies followed swiftly from his eager and inspired pen, The School for Scandal, The Duenna, and The Critic, each greeted with enthusiasm by a world to which such dramatic triumphs were a revelation and a delight. Sheridan was not only the talk of the town, he was hailed universally as the brightest dramatic star of the age. It is needless to say that Sheridan's fame was a delight to his wife. Quote, not long ago, she wrote to a friend, he was known as Mrs. Sheridan's husband. Now the tables are turned, and henceforth I expect I shall be just Mr. Sheridan's wife. Nor could I wish any more exalted title. I am proud and thankful to be the wife of the cleverest man in England, and the best husband in the world. That Mrs. Sheridan adored her husband is evident from every letter she wrote to him. She addresses him as, My dearest love, and My darling Dick and vows that she cannot be happy apart from him. I cannot love you, she declares, and be perfectly satisfied at such a distance from you. I depended upon your coming tonight, and shall not recover my spirits till we meet. But through her letters runs the same hankering after the old, simple, peaceful days, the days of love in a cottage. I could draw, she writes, such a picture of happiness that it would almost make me wish the over overthrow of all our present schemes of future affluence and grandeur. But greatly as he loved his wife, Sheridan was now too much wedded to his ambition to listen to such tempting. He had conquered fame with his pen. Now he aspired to subdue it with his tongue. In 1780, while he was still in his twenties, he was sent to Parliament by Stafford suffrages, and from his first appearance at Westminster captivated his fellow lawmakers by the magic of his eloquence. A new star had arisen in the oratorical firmament, and soon began to pale all other luminaries. Within two years he was a minister of the crown, and in another year he had electrified the world by the most brilliant oratory that had ever been heard in our tongue, notably by his historic speech in the trial of Warren Hastings, to the preparation of which his wife had devoted herself body and soul. 
Fresh from listening to this latest sensational triumph of her husband in Westminster Hall, she wrote, It is impossible to convey to you the delight, the astonishment, the admiration he has excited in the breasts of every class of people. Every party prejudice has been overcome by this display of genius, eloquence, and goodness. What my feelings must be, you can only imagine. To tell you the truth, it is with some difficulty that I can let my mind down, as Mr. Burke said afterwards, to talk or think on any other subject. But pleasure too exquisite becomes pain, and I am at this moment suffering from the delightful anxieties of last week. But Mrs. Sheridan's day of happiness and triumph was soon to draw near to its close. She saw her husband climb to the dizziest pinnacle of fame, and she watched with pain his brilliance dimmed and his marvelous intellect clouded by excessive drinking before the fatal seeds of consumption, which had already carried off her dearly loved sister, began to show themselves in her. Her illness was as swift as it was happily painless. She simply drooped, and faded and died, tenderly watched over to the last by her husband, with a silent anguish that was pitiful to see. Quote, During her last days, says Mrs. Canning, her devoted friend, she read sometimes to herself, and after dinner sat down to the piano. She taught Betty, her little niece, a little while, and played several slow movements out of her own head, with her usual expression but with a very trembling hand. It was so like the last efforts of an expiring genius, and brought such a train of tender and melancholy ideas to my imagination that I thought my poor heart would have burst in the conflict. And one June day, when the world she had loved so well was flooded with a glory of sunlight, her beautiful spirit sped silently away to join the choir invisible. Nine days later, she was laid to rest in Wells Cathedral, thousands flocking to pay farewell homage to the closest link the world has ever known between an angel and a woman. As for Sheridan, he survived his grief twenty-four years, to end his days in poverty, and to crown his life's drama with a stately funeral in Westminster Abbey. End of chapter 2